On this Monday night, Canada's capital under a state of emergency. After 11 days, police are finally taking action, attempting to clear protesters. We are turning up the heat in every way we possibly can. His appeal for help to cut off funding and fuel and the injunction to stop the horns. Plus, we look at foreign influence on the protest. We need to be very vigilant about external forces that funds which are being collected are not used for inappropriate purposes. Also tonight, high stakes meeting over Ukraine. Sit down, please. The French president visits Moscow. His his message to the Russian president and Canada's golden hour. How one athlete's comeback from cancer led to gold. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a number of angles on the rapidly evolving situation in the nation's capital on this 11th day of what the city's police chief calls an occupation. A judge has issued an interim injunction to halt the honking. And last night, for the first time, police officers began to dismantle some of the structures built by the protesters, seizing some of the diesel fuel containers, issuing tickets, making a handful of arrests and towing some vehicles. But Ottawa's police chief says he needs more help. We are stretched to the limit, but we are 100 percent committed to using everything we have to end this demonstration. We cannot do it alone. Late today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau took part in an emergency debate in the House of Commons. He said the protest organizers are intent on blocking democracy and the economy. This pandemic has sucked for all Canadians. But Canadians know the way to get through it is to continue listening to science, continuing to lean on each other, continuing to be there for each other. Democracy in Canada didn't happen by accident, and it won't continue without effort. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken is watching developments. David. Well, Donna, there are fewer protesters than there were a few days ago, but those that are here, they've got access to food, funds, and fuel. And so the battle now is to interrupt those supply lines. We're going after the fuel. Shame! Shame. Police on Sunday Shame. night cleared out a supply depot of fuel and food that protesters had built near the city's downtown. Several arrests were made. The energy around the protest almost immediately changed. Uh, we saw it in the live streams where individuals uh, you know, were almost shocked that you know, the police had taken action and were trying to rationalize it. But on Monday, our cameras caught protesters still running a refueling operation for the trucks parked near Parliament Hill. People like me will come an hour away or two hours away and we'll bring the fuel. And that's all we'll do. We'll keep at it. They're going to try to find every way to slow us down, to make us disband or uh, drop our morale. It's not going to work. While other protesters played decoy. So is that an empty one? It's empty. Some cans had juice or water. Others were empty all just to confound police. At City Hall, a day after declaring a state of emergency, the mayor and council are asking for another 1,500 police and civilian personnel. It was unclear what they'll get. All the federal government offered Monday was a promise of more talk with the province and the city. That this is simply building upon the active and ongoing conversation, collaboration and coordination. Meanwhile, in an Ottawa courtroom late today, a judge granted an injunction sought by some people who live downtown to order those protesters to stop using their air horns. That order will be in place for 10 days, but we have talked to some already, Donna, who plan to keep on honking. Okay, David Aiken in Ottawa, thanks. Well, people who live and work in downtown Ottawa have had it with that endless blaring of horns and the disruption, even harassment from some protesters. And now the police arson unit is investigating whether someone tried to start a fire inside the lobby of a nearby apartment building. As Ross Lord reports, it's ignited fear in residents who say it feels like they are under siege. It was shortly after 5 a.m. Sunday when two men entered this Ottawa apartment building and started a fire. Terrifying actions captured on surveillance cameras. Residents say it happened about an hour after they confronted protesters verbally about noise outside the building. I was up between three and five from the sounds of the honking. 
I couldn't sleep. Like many other residents, this woman says she's afraid to be identified in case she's singled out and targeted. Matias Munoz is an exception. This is a perfect example of the situation that can arise when this kind of like lawlessness happens. Even more shocking is this section of the surveillance video. There was evidence of somebody taping our door shut. Um, so somebody came in, tried to light a fire and basically lock us, all, all of us in here. Allegations that someone tried to start a fire in this building lobby are driving a new wedge between residents and the protesters. And How nerves are wearing thin. Did you just like wake up and find the first person with a flag and try and blame them for everything? I'm blaming the culture and the environment so it's that, my fault. that that Man, you I, that the event bread. that you're participating in has created yeah. one of don't constant look, harassment, no. intimidation, and threats. Both men in this exchange declined to be interviewed. We're concealing the identity of residents who say they're afraid their homes have become targets. This is really the scariest day that I've I've had <laughs> here uh, or ever. <laughs> Global News spoke to a woman who encountered the men in the lobby. She says one of them told her, I'm a protester, I support the protest. As the Ottawa Police Arson Unit investigates, some residents say they're so shaken they've decided to sleep elsewhere. They say the lobby could easily have caught fire, leading to loss of life. There's a lot of well-meaning people out there trying to fight for what they believe in. I don't agree with it, but there are bad actors that come out of the woodwork in these kind of situations. While sleep has been in short supply for the last 11 days, residents hope for peace in coming days as they await an outcome. Ross Lord, Global News, Ottawa. Oh, what's happening on the streets of Ottawa is plain to see. What is less easy to discern is who is funding and who is influencing this protest. What's clear is it's not all coming from within Canada. Everyone from former U.S. President Donald Trump to Senator Ted Cruz have weighed in on the trucker convoy. It's getting lots of coverage on right-wing media in the U.S. Jackson Prosco explores who is backing this protest with money and moral support. Well, tensions are boiling over across our northern border. On conservative cable news channels, the protest dominates. The attempts to try and crush down on this protest in Ottawa has made it a rallying cry. Following suit, Republican politicians and even a former president have taken up the cause. And we want those great Canadian truckers to know that we are with them all the way. Global interest in the Ottawa protest is being driven by the powerful American right with claims of big tech censorship adding a new layer to their efforts after GoFundMe shut down the truckers' online fundraising campaign. Their corporate communists are stealing money. It, I mean, this is literally theft by deception. It all puts Ottawa at the center of the American culture wars, which may have been the strategy all along when U.S.-based groups took notice in the early days. The scale of the level of donations and the, the international interest too seems to be quite unprecedented. Kieran O'Connor is a researcher in online extremism. He says interest in the Canadian trucker protest and its anti-government, anti-mandate message has since spread worldwide at a phenomenal pace. I was able to find evidence of international support for the original GoFundMe link from groups and communities outside of Canada. Uh, I was able to find evidence of the GoFundMe being shared amongst white supremacist communities on Telegram. And after GoFundMe pulled the plug, an alternative fundraising campaign raised nearly $5 million in just a few days. Many of those donations purport to be from the U.S. Many more are anonymous. We need to be very vigilant about uh, external forces, about foreign interference, uh, and that, uh, that funds which are being collected are not used for inappropriate purposes, which may indeed undermine public safety. Taken with the statements from American elected officials, the former U.S. ambassador to Canada sees reason for serious concern. Well, there's a group now within the Republican Party that sees this differently and is willing to go cross what I consider to be a red line. And that red line is to be promoting disruptive activity in our neighbor, friend, and ally's backyard. Those efforts are no longer limited to supporting the Canadian protests. Efforts to recreate the Ottawa convoy and its disruption are now underway here in Washington, in cities across the U.S., and right around the world. Donna? Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. 
Public health restrictions continue to ease in parts of this country. Tonight in Quebec, theaters, concert halls and sporting venues are among the businesses now allowed to reopen at half capacity with a maximum occupancy of 500. That limit increases to 1,000 for outdoor events. Proof of vaccination is still required and more restrictions are scheduled to be lifted next week. In Newfoundland and Labrador, bars and restaurants are now able to open at 50% capacity. Cinemas and performance spaces can operate at 25% capacity. They're not allowed to serve food or drinks. Funerals, weddings and other religious and cultural ceremonies can go ahead with a limit of 50 people or 25% capacity, whichever is less. Financial aid is on the way for British Columbia's agricultural industry, three months after floods and landslides devastated parts of the province. The provincial and federal governments will provide $228 million in recovery and restoration funding to farmers and ranchers who suffered losses. I do know that um, uh, this has been a very trying time and so with that in mind we're looking at uh, the serious cases in front of us and making sure that they, those checks roll out ASAP. Farmers can now apply for money to cover expenses including animal welfare, repairs and restoration of land and perennial plants like blueberries. Damage from the disaster is estimated to be about $285 million with upwards of 1,100 farms affected. The push for a peaceful solution over Ukraine. Coming up, the French president's message to Russia's president. Efforts are continuing to find a diplomatic solution to the tension over Ukraine. French President Emmanuel Macron met the Russian president in Moscow today. His message, the West wants to avoid war and build trust. It's one of a series of meetings aimed at cooling tensions. Redmond Shannon reports. Touchdown in Poland for five U.S. military planes Monday, carrying some of the 3,000 extra American troops being deployed to NATO's eastern edges in response to Russia's military buildup along Ukraine's borders. Uh, Russia could be able uh, to actually have sufficient forces for a serious invasion by the end of this month. Moscow denies it will invade Ukraine, yet a flurry of diplomacy is aiming to prevent it. World leaders and key players meeting in Washington, Kyiv and Moscow. In the Russian capital, French President Emmanuel Macron meeting with Vladimir Putin. No breakthrough after talks, but the Russian president described their meeting as useful. He wants NATO to stop its expansion east and to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO, something experts say is not imminent anyway. Macron repeated NATO's red lines on Ukraine being allowed to determine its own future. The bloc is proposing measures on arms control in the region instead. Putin is likely more trusting of Macron. Their two countries, along with Germany and Ukraine, have been speaking on and off for eight years to try and resolve the fighting in eastern Ukraine. It's the only format where Russians talk to Ukrainians, um, and so that's the way to bring the Ukrainians at the table. Good afternoon. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in Washington, where U.S. President Joe Biden repeated his threat of heavy sanctions if Russia invades. There will be no longer... A Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. But Olaf Scholz stopped just short of naming Germany and Russia's Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline as a sanction on the table. And we will not taking different steps. We will do the same steps. Emmanuel Macron now heads to Kyiv, where he meets with his Ukrainian counterpart, Vladimir Zelensky, Tuesday. Germany's foreign minister is also heading to the front lines of the ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine. Donna? All right, Redmond Shannon in London tonight. Thanks. Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai made an surprise appearance as a spectator at the Beijing Winter Olympics on the weekend. She also met with members of the International Olympic Committee, though the IOC is not commenting on whether she's able to speak and move about freely. We, uh, as a sports organization, are doing everything to ensure um, that she uh, is happy. And I don't think it's up for us to be able to judge in one way or another her position. 
In an interview with a French newspaper, Peng denied she accused a top Chinese official of sexual assault in a social media post in November. She says it was all an enormous misunderstanding and the post, which was quickly pulled, was taken out of context. The 38-year-old's whereabouts and well-being were a mystery for weeks before she resurfaced. Snowboarding survivor ahead, why this Canadian Olympian's greatest victory may not have been at the Games. It was a big day for Canadian athletes at the Winter Olympics in Beijing. Quebec native Kim Boutin won bronze in the women's 500-meter short track speed skating event. This is her fourth Olympic medal. She won three at the 2018 Winter Olympics in South Korea. Team Canada also won bronze in the Olympic debut of mixed team ski jumping. It's also this country's first ever medal in any ski jumping event. Making the win even sweeter, the four-person team was not even considered a medal contender going into the event. And three is the magic number for Canadian snowboarder Mark McMorris. He was among three Canadians to enter the men's slope-style final, and he nabbed his third bronze medal for the event for his third Olympics in a row. He wasn't the only Canadian on the podium. We'll have more on that in a moment. First, the medal standings. Team Canada is behind the Russian athletes competing under the Russian Olympic Committee flag. We have six medals now, including one gold. And that single Canadian gold belongs to snowboarder Max Parot, who took the top spot in the slope style final. It's his first Olympic gold, an award most athletes might consider their greatest achievement. That's not the case for him. Just months ago, he overcame an even tougher event, the fight for his life. Mike Drolet explains. Max Perot called this the run of his life. The moment he landed his final jump, he knew he had a good chance at gold. And then his dream came true. But what a nightmare it was to get here. After winning silver in the 2018 Olympic Games, Perot's world came crashing down. Announcing to the world... That he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, a type of blood cancer, forcing him to undergo 12 rounds of chemotherapy over the next six months. It's a challenge I've never faced before. He was fighting for his life, yet he now says the hardest part was not being able to hit the slopes. It was actually really hard times for me at the time. I felt like I was a lion in a cage because I wasn't able to do what I love the most, which is snowboarding. Um, you know, I've been snowboarding since I'm nine years old, and that was the first time in my life that I had to put <clears throat> the snowboard in a closet. Two months after getting a clean bill of health, he wasn't just snowboarding again, he was back competing and winning. He was still the same Max, living life to its fullest, but he says he now smiles twice as much and he no longer puts the same type of pressure on himself in competitions. You know, as a person, you know, I used to take life for, for granted before as well, and I don't anymore. So every time I strap my feet on my snowboard, uh, I appreciate so much more than, than, than before. Considering where he was exactly three years ago, nothing seems to be weighing him down anymore. Least of all, that shiny new gold medal. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. You are the enemy of the people. You're the vile liars. Next, the threats to journalists and to democracy. We are two years into this pandemic and everyone is exhausted. People are lonely. People have lost loved ones. They've lost jobs. Others are overworked. The coronavirus has killed more than 5 million people around the world. 5 million. It's hard to comprehend. And it's understandable some people are angry and want someone to blame. Politicians, public health officers, and the media are all targets. But on the streets in Canada over the last 11 days, things have been said that I thought I'd never hear in this country. A state of emergency in Canada's capital the city centre paralysed by people demanding freedom. Profane insults directed at the Prime Minister. The organisers calling for Parliament to be dissolved. How did it come to this? Why is the truth and lies the public? And there's not a journalist in this world right now. There's not one journalist out there that can write a story properly. There is a lot to dissect about this protest, and it's important to point out not everyone is this angry. 
But one thing's clear. We no longer have an agreed set of facts. And journalists trying to listen to protesters' concerns have become targets. Can you sleep at night? How can you sleep at night with all the lies? Global news. The propagandists themselves. It's as if they've forgotten Canada is free. If you refuse to tell the truth. They can walk down the street hurling insults. Tell the truth. Canadians have political rights and civil liberties. We have democratically elected governments, free and fair elections, and a free press. Freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press, is protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Yet in Toronto, this happened to a global news reporter. After your convictions, your executions cannot come soon enough. You are the enemy of the people. You're the vile liars. Where have we heard that before? A few days ago, I called the fake news the enemy of the people. And they are. They are the enemy of the people. When the former U.S. president first said that, it sounded shocking. Now we hear it on Canadian streets. Maria Ressa, an investigative journalist and co-winner of the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize, warns of a slide into fascism enabled by technology. Our greatest need today is to transform that hate and violence. The toxic sludge that's coursing through our information ecosystem prioritized by American internet companies that make more money by spreading that hate and triggering the worst in us. Triggering the worst in us. We are all tired of public health restrictions. When and how to loosen them is worth civil debate. This is not that. Ressa and others believe there is an insidious manipulation happening at scale, and we're only beginning to wrap our heads around it. As she says, without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without trust, we have no shared reality, no democracy. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Your Canada tonight is the Peace Tower on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.